Welcome to Think Tech on Spectrum OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Elise Anderson. In our show this time, we'll attend a talk on deep sea mining by visiting Professor Philomene Verlan at the Science Cafe. She's an oceanographer specializing in the biogeochemistry and ecology of deep sea mining and also a lawyer specializing in the law of the sea. The Science Cafe, part of the Hawaii Academy of Science, celebrated its 10-year anniversary with a talk by Philomene Verlan, a visiting colleague at the Department of Oceanography in the School of Ocean and Earth Science, SOEST, at UH Manoa. Dr. Verlan is an oceanographer specializing in the biogeochemistry and ecology of deep sea mining of ferromanganese nodules and crusts. She took her PhD at Imperial College in London. In her work, she has done some 24 ocean research voyages. I'm coming up to number 25 in two weeks. Okay, well, now you're, you're on the surface on these voyages. <laughs> You, you can't go down uh, two miles to look at the, at the nodules. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, can you? Oh, how do you oh, do that? I want to know how you yes, do you that. Can. Yeah. Unfortunately, we no longer at this university have the submarine capacity to do this. We used to. And the US generally doesn't have a great deal of submarine research capacity anymore. We do still have our wonderful Alvin, mm -hmm. which I believe has just been reconfigured to go down to 4,500 meters. Mm -hmm. But other countries, unfortunately, are um, doing much better than we are um, at this. And, uh, but I was lucky when we still had the two Pisces subs here to do oh, the my... The two Pisces, I've seen had, them. Yeah. They were at Sand Island in Snug Harbor in Sand yeah. Island, the yeah. university. Yeah, they're now... Yeah. They're, well, the last time I saw them, they were out Makapu'u ah, at the point there, okay. just where Makai has yeah, its yeah, pier. Yeah, Makai pier. Yeah. The, um, so I was really lucky. I got to do all of my master's work with the two Pisces on Cross Seamount, which has a huge ferromanganese crust resource, in fact, and it's just south of the Big Island. And, but the Pisces were never able to go any deeper than 2,000 meters, which is already pretty deep. deep but not deep enough to look at these men? No. Okay. No, no, no. She's also a lawyer specializing in the law of the sea. She assists international public and private entities in the interface between marine science and the law of the sea to achieve responsible deep sea mining. I ran away to sea later. <laughs> Why did you do that? Well, the sort of law I was doing was international trade based in Europe, the former Treaty of Rome. I became rather frustrated with the direction that was taking and revisited my career decisions when my law firm, which was completely wonderful, offered me a partnership and thought that I would actually like to return to my first love, which was marine science. Ah which I did. But now it's kind of a combination, isn't it? Completely. It could not have been more useful to still have that law degree. Can you describe that connection for me, the combination and how it works for you? Yes, with pleasure, because I hope it might inspire other people when they want to revisit their careers that they don't need to throw away an entire degree. They might make it work for them. Mm. Uh, marine science is governed by an international treaty called the Law of the Sea Convention and marine science, and in fact, all marine activities or activities on land, which is not very well known, that affect the marine environment is governed by this treaty. So those of you who are thinking about carbon dioxide emissions, for example, yes, it is covered, and it is being comprehensively ignored by the international community. Deep sea mining is an emerging marine industry with huge prospects, competition, and contention. The technological, scientific, environmental, social, industrial, political, economic, and legal challenges that must be addressed to make it profitable, however, are very challenging. These nodules are in uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction. The um, most important resource is, in fact, not very far away from here at all. You have Hawaii here and Mexico there. We have two fracture zones called the clarion clipperton Fracture Zone. And the most interesting resource is right there. But it is in international waters, which means that no single country can go and recover them without first seeking permission from an authority that is international as well, that has been set up to govern the exploration and the exploitation of these resources. What's the name of that authority? It is called the International Seabed Authority, and it is headquartered in Kingston, Jamaica. It has 167 countries, plus the European Union 
that are party to the Law of the Sea Convention and being party to the Convention makes them also members of the authority. Uh, so anything you do out there in international waters with regard to nodules needs the approval of 167 countries plus the EU. Now this not is, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. is not a party to the Law of the Sea Convention. This is a sad thing. The U.S. has, however, signed one part of one of the amending treaties to the Law of the Sea Convention, but it has not ratified that signature. Yeah. The countries out there have to get special permission from the International Seabed, Seabed. Authority to go out there, and they're given usually a uh, usually um, it ends up being a seventy-five thousand square kilometer. License. Area, yeah. It's bigger, but then it gets legally weird, and you guys don't want to hear about that. But <laughs> it ends up with about 75,000 square kilometers that they can then go, and then according to all the criteria that are set by the authority under the auspices of the Law of the Sea Convention, they can do the resource assessment. They have to do a huge amount of research simply to establish environmental baseline so that when they start mining... As a condition of the license. Oh, it's a, not only is it a mega condition, it is very, very, very closely observed. They observed, okay. Every year there has to be a complete report sent to the ISA. Um, in, in, I've seen some of these, they're like this. This costs an enormous amount of money, but for all of this, a resource assessment, and then towards the end of the exploration, it's possible to start doing a bit of tech development. Um, so research assessment, environmental baseline, and tech development. That means equipment. In the, in the that mic. means equipment, but yeah. that also means videos. That means everything that goes on down yeah. there is imaged. Yeah. Yeah. What would happen? What would the Seabed Authority do if China decided it wanted, sort of the way it's handled the South China Seas, right? Uh, it decided it wanted cobalt uh, nodules, and uh, the hell with anybody to try to stop them. Well, I don't know what the Seabed Authority would do, but we have, in the Law of the Sea Convention, an extensive set of chapters that um, talk about dispute resolution. And it has also set up a specialized tribunal called the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. It also has, within that context, a specialized seabed disputes tribunal. And that is where the uh, situation would be brought. Whether it be brought by the authority or by other countries that might find that this is problematic from their own point of view is um, an open point, mm -hmm. an open question, mm -hmm. but that is where it would be taken in the first in in um, instance to have the um, international court that has been set up specifically to deal with these subjects. Yep. The judges are based in Hamburg, and they're elected for, I believe, uh, anyway, some sort of term, um, and, uh, and they're elected they by that, the members of the, of the parties. Suppose they yeah. found that uh, China had uh, willfully mm -hmm. um, violated the rules of the seaboard, uh, seabed authority. What, what would they be able to do? A court as such can do nothing. It can simply state whether or not this is or is not consistent with the obligations under the law of the Sea Convention. And how that is that these judgments are then enforced, again, because it is an international judgment, um, by the countries in various ways. There are in various ways. Sanctions by there are various some countries against other countries. Responses. That example. might be, for example, one potential yeah, response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What generally tends to happen is a lot of in the corridor type discussion afterwards. Mm -hmm.
Dr. Verlan's talk described the deep sea metal bearing mineral deposits that are of greatest interest to the industry. Ferromanganese nodules, cobalt crusts, and polymetallic sulfides found on the ocean floor 4,500 meters below sea level southeast of Hawaii and their distinctive biogeophysical marine environments. She presented an overview of the industrial interest in these resources, the extraction technologies, and the technical, environmental, and regulatory issues with emphasis on the Pacific Islands. When I decided to go back and become completely qualified in oceanography, which meant to go up to the PhD level, I became really, really interested in deep sea manganese crusts and nodules. Now these are ocean precipitates that are found in the deep sea. They drop to the bottom. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, yes, absolutely. Um, they form um, in situ, uh, in their place, around little, uh, uh, with the in the case of nodules, they form around little nuclei like shark's teeth, for example, and the crusts form on sea mounts, but the principle is the same, they need a hard surface to form on. I became really, really interested in those. And with regard to the nodules, the most interesting resource of nodules, which is for their metal content. Ferrous manganese. Uh, in fact, manganese is probably the least interesting of the metals. The ferrous then. What, the iron is even less interesting. Mm, mm. The most interesting content for the nodules are copper, cobalt, nickel, and zinc and some molybdenum. And right now, cobalt is the one that is of particular interest because of its huge use in all of our electronic devices that um, everyone has to have. And it is also a strategic metal. And it is also very difficult to find on land in a context where you can have security of supply that is also environmentally and um, socially licensed. What's, so, a, what's a strategic metal? What is this? A strategic, strategic metal, anything used in any kind of defense purpose. Uh -huh. Yes, okay. yes, yes. The nodule forming mechanism um, is, in that sense, uh, quite ubiquitous, hmm. but the ones that form with this particular type of metal composition, though they're not very, very Found, uh, found ubiquitously. You've got this major resource here in the clarion Clipperton zone. You've got another huge resource in the Central Indian Ocean Basin. You've got a few in the Atlantic Ocean. You've got um, quite a few, but smaller resources in the South Pacific. But no, the ones that are really attractive, the Goldilocks nodules, if you want to call them like yes, that, yes, yes. there's not that, that many oh. places in the world. Our background over there, is that ferrous manganese mod Those nodules? Those are ferromanganese nodules. Okay. And they are, in fact, I believe, uh, quite a representative field of what you can find in the Clarion Clipperton zone. And that is actually quite a rich coverage of nodules. Mm -hmm. The, and those, the blue objects there, the, the rock-looking objects, those are the those nodules? Those are the nodules, and you must note, because this is very important when you look at the environmental consequences of removing them, those nodules are resting on sediments. And what you have there is a hard sub bottom, a hard substrate, which is the nodule, on a soft substrate, which is the sediments. And one of the two issues that are environmentally of concern and which have really, really interesting technical possibilities is to remove those nodules in such a way that you do not leave pure sediments behind because in the deep sea there are two types of organisms in this particular context. There are the ones that like to live on sediments and the ones that like to live on nodules, and the two do not mix. So if you remove all the nodules, all the organisms that like to live on nodules have no place to go back to. So one of the interesting technical challenges in um, deep sea mining is to design a mining system that either leaves either nodules behind or um, types of them. nodules yeah. Yeah. that, um, well, no, actually, um, that it does anyway. That's the problem. That's one other problem to work with, but I'll give you that one in a minute. Either leaves nodules behind or substitutes for the nodules or mines in such a way that you leave little strips with nodules on the seafloor. 
and all of this, it's a technical question and it's also a mining approach question. Because you could, for example, design a miner that will suction up the nodules at one Meaning end. Meaning a machine. Exactly. Uh, yeah, mining. V yes, thank you. And then leaves, them, leaves others behind uh, as you as you um, collect them from one end and send them up to the top of the ship, you just have other little nodules that are brought out the back, for example. Or there are several different ways you can go about it. Now, the other major environmental problem, remember the sediments? Well, um, you're going to generate a big cloud of sediment as you're going over the, the seafloor. This is also not a good idea because um, you want to minimize that sediment, if you possibly can, because there are out there filter feeders who need quite clear water in order to be able to filter their food out of the water. Now, if you clog up those filters, you know that from your dryer, you've got issues. Well, you've got the same thing in the deep sea. So another really, really interesting technical challenge is to um, design your mining vehicle so that it generates the least amount of sediment. And another area that is really important and that we need to have um, a lot more information on is to find that you will generate some form of sediment, but how far does that cloud go? And how thick is it going to be? And how quickly will it attenuate with distance? And all of this requires a lot of in situ experimentation, like also deciding what would be the best way to mine to leave some form of hard substrate behind. You also need in situ experimentation to do some form of mimicking, at least, of what the mining might look like in the real world, so you can start looking where the sediment plumes go. Hawaii is hugely lucky, and so is the United States, because the entire Hawaiian island archipelago has, um, and also the other areas that um, are associated in various ways to the United States, like Johnson Atoll, etc. There are nodule, and more importantly, in this context, ferromanganese crust nodules. Within the US EEZ, the US doesn't really need to go to the clarion Clipperton zone if it wanted to have those um, resources available. It's got it within its own jurisdictional waters. And in fact, we were the first here in the US and the state of Hawaii long ago to do the first environmental impact study. And it was state of the art, and it's still extremely good for the mining of manganese crusts. And also to the certain, and processing, by the way, processing. This was all going to, also going to be done in the islands. This was back in the 70s. And I think, I think it was the, what was then called the Minerals Management Service for the state of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. It's changed names since mm -hmm. then. Exploration involves, at this point, three big elements, all of which are controlled and mandated by the International Seabed Authority in these areas. Uh, because this is all still in international waters. Resource assessment, in other words, um, how many kilos per square meter are there and how variable is this resource? Because one thing that's really interesting about manganese nodules is you can have a really rich deposit, which you see here. You go a couple of hundred meters to the north or to the south or to the west, and it could be much less. It could also be much more, and it could also be not there at all. And what keeps me going as a research scientist is that we still don't fully understand how nodules form. All these boundaries that we like to put in the sea, the sea doesn't recognize them, completely irrelevant to them, right? To anything that lives in the oceans, which is another aspect of the convention. It's the only international instrument that actually does take a global view of the environment. However, your question was, a little bit down the road, and well, in international waters, in fact, it's not going to be such a huge gold mine as you might think, because what was trying to be avoided was to have exactly that kind of gold rush, where again, only the highly technically sophisticated countries could go sit on a resource mm. and take all the benefits. Mm. The benefits from that mining needs to be shared with the rest of the world. Dr. Verlan's talk was part of a film and seminar series co-sponsored by the Center for Pacific Island Studies at the University of Hawaii and the Pacific Islands Development Program at East-West Center. If you want to know more about the Oceanography Program at the School of Ocean and Earth Science at UH Manoa, check it out at soas.hawaii.edu.
And now let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. There's so much happening in Hawaii. Sometimes things happen under the radar and we don't hear much about them, but ThinkTech will take you there. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. To stay current on what's happening in government, industry, academia, and communities around the islands and the world. ThinkTech broadcasts its daily talk shows live on the internet from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. If you missed the show, or if you want to replay or share our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. The audio is on thinktechhawaii.com slash audio. And we post podcasts of all our shows on iTunes. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links, or sign up on our email list to get the daily docket of our upcoming shows. Think Tech has a high-tech green screen studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to join our live audience or participate in our shows, write to shows at thinktechhawaii.com. Give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at thinktechhi. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives together in these islands and in this country. We want to stay in touch with you, and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. Let's think together. And yes, you can call in to our talk shows live. While you're watching any of our shows, you can call into 808-374-2014 and pose a question or participate in the discussion. And now here's this week's ThinkTech commentary. Aloha, my name is Jay Fidel. I'm the CEO of ThinkTech Hawaii. ThinkTech is a Hawaii nonprofit dedicated to raising public awareness about tech, energy diversification, global affairs, and much more through digital media. We stream 35 live talk shows a week on thinktechhawaii.com. We upload them to YouTube and iTunes, and we broadcast our top shows on community television and Spectrum OC16 cable. Think Tech is a study in citizen journalism. The value of citizen journalism is that all the people involved become more actively engaged in a more thoughtful examination of the world around them. By this interaction, we can build a more dynamic, productive community dialogue. We can become more curious, more aware, and better informed and educated, and better citizens. We can separate the wheat from the chaff and raise the clarity of our collective thinking. And Lord knows we need that clarity in these difficult, divisive, and most interesting times. Now, more than ever, watch us, follow us, and like us. We're ThinkTech at thinktechhawaii.com. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters.
Okay, Elise, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Elise does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more Think Tech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on Think Tech, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our Think Tech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii. And of course, the study of ancient education in Egypt. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important Think Tech episode. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Elise Anderson. Aloha, everyone. Mm -hmm.